on that he touched me song there's a kind of an easy way out for the bass on that song Clyde was not let me take the easy way out tonight he made me go down low <laughs> he was like pointing down like you got to take the hard way so he made me take the hard way tonight appreciate that Clyde <laughs> pushing me like that uh anyway um Rianne and Brandon Blinky as y'all know him are getting married uh, here at the building on the 14th of May. So we'll put this up at 2 o'clock. So, uh, so we'll put this up on the bulletin board. You all are all, of course, invited to that. Hopefully we'll be able to get a shower arranged for them before this. But um, anyway, we're excited about this and hope that you're a part of it with us. We'll put that up on the bulletin board. Um, <coughs> I've been talking about Christ on, the, on our characters and talked about the resurrection the literal three days in the tomb and if you missed that you'll have to listen to it i think it's quite interesting getting to that literal i just turned the air on getting to that literal three days uh in the tomb instead of our traditional catholic version of that um friday saturday and sunday so if you didn't get a chance to uh hear that last sunday night it is available on facebook and youtube and you can listen to that if you wish to but what happens in the tomb? You know, Jesus is crucified, laid within the tomb. And I think it's then probably it gets really interesting. You know, Jesus, of course, the soul doesn't die. The Son of God was crucified. The Son of God, the Spirit of God, if you want to look at it that way, or the Spirit of the Son of God. Uh, what happens in that time, that time that it was uh, disembodied? In Ephesians chapter 4, it says, therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, he led captive a host of captives, and he gave gifts to men. Now, this expression, he ascended, what does it mean except that he also had descended into the lower parts of the earth? He who descended is himself also he who ascended far beyond all the heavens, so that he might fill all things. You know, Jesus died with our sins upon him. The Bible says that he's a propitiation of our sin, and propitiation that word means to take the place of. Literally, Jesus took our place in death, not necessarily in death, but in the torment that we had received, the punishment that we would receive. And in order for that to happen, Jesus had to receive our punishment, had to receive our compensation. And the compensation for us is torment. The, converse, the compensation for us for this life, regardless of how good we think we might live it, the compensation for that is to go to torment. Paul says in Romans, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The wage of sin is death, Paul says in Romans 6, 23. The wages of sin is death. So our, our role, our torment should come. But Jesus took our place. And in order to do that, figuratively, he descended into the lower regions, descended into what would be torment or into Hades, the Hadean realm in, in Hebrew thought. And in that place he had to endure the punishment that you and i should endure satan did win for a couple of days there satan did win satan accomplished and captured the son of god and held him but they, he couldn't hold him that's the glory of the resurrection the glory of the gospel i think it's interesting in ephesians where he led captive a host of captives heaven wasn't open to the jews to be in God's presence was no more open to them without Jesus than it is to us. The Hebrew writer says at the end of Hebrews 11, he says, apart from us, they would not be made perfect. In other words, they had to have Christ just as much as we had to have Christ to attain eternity or to attain a home with Christ. If you remember the story of the rich man of Lazarus, Lazarus didn't go to what we would say heaven. Lazarus didn't go to the throne room of God. Lazarus went to the bosom of Abraham. Lazarus went to a place of comfort, but he couldn't go to heaven because their sins were still upon them. The Hebrew writer tells us the blood of bulls and goats can never take away sin. So there was no way for a Jew to be sinless or to die sinless without the blood of Christ. They waited for that blood just as much as you and I wait for that, waited for that blood. The blood of the cross flows both directions. It flows all the way to Adam and all the way to the end of time. The blood of Christ is the redemptive force of God for all those who are righteous or all those who lived according to God's word. Then Peter tells us in 1 Peter 3, he says, For Christ also died for sins once for all, the just for the unjust, so that he might bring us to God, having been put to death in the flesh, 
but made alive in the spirit. Interesting concept, isn't it? Spirit in the Greek, same word, spirit, soul, breath, wind, uh, pneuma, where we get our word pneumonia, same word in the Greek, so it's kind of interesting in translation. I always think it's funny when Jesus breathed the spirit on them, he pneuma pneuma them. Anyway, that's just kind of a joke I have, but, but nevertheless, uh, but he... Um, but it is that word, and so here we see spirit, sometimes we might see soul, sometimes we have problem with distinguishing exactly that, how that works, but the idea that Peter's conveying is that even though the body was dead, even though the body was in the tomb, because the body was in the tomb, the body laid in the tomb for three full days, and we talked about that. The body laid in the tomb for three full days and three full nights. The body was in the tomb. So in that part, the spirit of God or the soul of God, the disembodied soul, and that's what we see in the book of Revelation, where it says the souls are crying out from under the altar, how long, how long, the disembodied souls. Yet we speak of a physical resurrection, but that resurrection won't occur until the coming of Christ, 1 Thessalonians 4, right? That will bring with them those that have fallen asleep in Jesus, the trumpet of God will sound, and the dead in Christ will rise first, and those who are alive will remain will rise to meet him in the air. So there's a bodily resurrection coming. There's a resurrection of the body coming. But that hasn't occurred yet, won't occur. But Jesus is the first fruit of that. He's the first bodily resurrection, never to die again. And so in the Spirit, as Peter says, in the Spirit, he went and made proclamation. Uh, King James says, preach to those. The uh, word preach and proclamation, kind of the same word. Now in prison who once were disobedient when the patience of God kept waiting in the days of Noah during the construction of the ark in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through the water, right? So where did Jesus go? He went to that place of torment. He went to preach to those who were disobedient in the days of Noah, not to preach repentance or to preach a way to heaven, but to make proclamation to them, to say, look what God has done. Look what's gone on. They were still where, does Peter say? In prison. The scripture's plain. It says that he's able to reserve the ungodly under punishment until the day of judgment. So where are they? They're in punishment. Where did the rich man go? In the story of the rich man of Lazarus, he went to a place of torment. Oh, that he would just go and dip his finger in water and touch it to my tongue, for I'm in torment in these flames, the rich man says. So there is a place of torment, and there is a place of reward. And Jesus, taking our place, our propitiation, had to go to that place of torment. On the resurrection morning, in John 20, 17, when he saw Mary Magdalene, it really reinforces the thought. Because he tells Mary in this passage, he says, stop clinging. And that word there really means, don't hold on to me. It's very reminiscent of a soldier going to war and a mother clinging to her son as he goes off to board a train or to board a plane to go to war. Wants to hold him there. That's what it's talking about. Don't cling to me because he says, I've not yet ascended. I haven't ascended yet. I haven't ascended. But he says, I will ascend, right? He says, I've not ascended to the Father. Where is he at for three days and three nights? He was in torment. He was in Hades. He had descended, as we say in Scripture, to the lower regions of the earth. But then he ascended. His body was raised. His body was resurrected. The stone was rolled back. Some people say that stone might have weighed as much as two tons. That stone was rolled back, not so that Jesus could get out, so that we could see in. The resurrection morning, Mary uh, going to find them and then coming back and finding Jesus, the other women staying and seeing the angel uh, inside the tomb. But Mary, the first one recorded to see Jesus resurrected, comes and sees him resurrected, thinking he's the gardener, doesn't recognize him. Very strong proof of the resurrection. A man who's been scourged who's been beaten a crown of thorns placed upon his head hung upon a cross to die pierced in the side and yet mary doesn't see him as a bruised battered uh emancipated bloody uh person she sees him in a resurrected state but yet he still kept the scars didn't the interesting story in that and he says but i am going to ascend so jesus says i'm going to ascend to my father and your father to my god and to your god and so Jesus appeared to several, to Mary Magdalene in John chapter 20, verse 15 through 17, the two men on the road to Emmaus, Luke 24, 13 through 35. He appears to Peter, Luke 24, 34, even though we don't have record of necessarily that appearance. 
In Luke 24, it says he appeared to Peter or to Cephas, so he appeared to him. He appears to the 11 and eats fish, boiled fish, in Luke 24, 35 through 48, which not only speaks of his resurrection, but speaks of his bodily resurrection, that he was able to eat fish, he was able to eat something. Uh, Doubting Thomas, we always talk about, John chapter 20, verse 19 through 29. Thomas, where he says, put your hand in my side, feel me, touch my hands, touch me, feel me, appear behind locked doors. Uh, bodily resurrected Christ. John, of course, proposes that. We've talked about that. John is big on the bodily resurrection, on a physical resurrection. And then, of course, in John at the Sea of Tiberias with Peter, when he says, do you love me? Do you love me more than these? Feed my lamb, tend my sheep. The story of Jesus eating with them, making breakfast for them at the Sea of Tiberias, the Sea of Galilee. Actually, that is Tiberias is on the on the western shore of Galilee, and he's sitting there with him, making that breakfast, eating with them in a resurrected form, eating and drinking with them to show that he is bodily resurrected, not just a spirit resurrected, but a body resurrected. And how important is that in our story? How important is that for our resurrection? Well, it's really important, isn't? Isn't that what Paul talks about in First Corinthians? Corinthians 15, that will all, there's a natural body and there's a spiritual body, there's a heavenly body, and that all bodies aren't the same, but we're going to receive a heavenly body. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 4, that the body will be raised to, to be with a soul, that we're going to have a body. Paul alludes to it when he says, while we're in this tent, we long to be clothed with our heavenly dwelling. He doesn't talk about the spirit, he's longing to be clothed with our heavenly dwelling, clothed with our body, clothed with the resurrected body. So very important, the bodily resurrection and Jesus being the first fruits of that and this example of that, that it's a physical place. And you, we don't understand sometimes the ramifications of this. It's not just saying that we'll have a physical body, but if we're going to have a body, then it makes heaven. It makes heaven. We talk about in Revelation, there'll be a new heaven and a new earth where righteousness dwells. Well, he's not saying he's going to create a new earth like this earth. It means there'll be a new place where righteousness dwells. But you have to understand, if we're a physical body, then isn't the heaven that will be created, isn't that a physical place? It's not just a spiritual realm, it's not just an idea or a concept, but it's a physical place. It's a place that God's making a place for us. That's really important to me, and it should be to you. Because so many times people look at heaven as spirit and spiritual and spiritual warfare, and we talk about that, about this uh, maybe a different plane of existence or a different reality. We talk about a lot of those things in modern film and media, and a lot of those ideas get stuck in our head. But from a biblical standpoint, Jesus is saying that we're going to have a physical place to dwell in a physical body. So when we sing that song, Mansions Over the Hilltop, which we get from uh, John 14, right, where really it means dwelling places, not mansions, but King James says mansions. I'll go with mansions. So we... So when we have that place, it'll be a physical place. And that's really, really important, or it should be to you and me, that heaven is a real place, a physical place that God will create for a physically resurrected body for those who are obedient to his will. And Jesus is proof of that. He's the proof that we will have a physical, a bodily resurrection. And I think it's interesting that they knew who he was, didn't they? You know, people always ask me, well, will they know who we are? Well, they knew who Jesus was. They knew what the resurrected Jesus, but yet he still carried those scars. And I think that's interesting, an interesting story. But in 1 Corinthians 15, 3, probably the oldest Christian creed, we call it, that Paul reiterates before he gets into his great chapter on the resurrected body. He says, for I deliver to you as a first importance that I also receive. This predates Paul. This Christian creed predates Paul. It says that he died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. We talked about appearing to Paul, seeing that in Luke uh, 24. So he, uh, Paul re here reiterates that. He appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. The twelve, Judas, of course, had committed suicide, but he had been replaced, right? So there was another apostle there. So there were indeed still twelve apostles. So Paul's not wrong. He appeared to the twelve. Um, after that, he appeared to more than 500 brethren at one time, which we don't have record of other than in this creed of Paul. But it is a Christian creed, and it had to have occurred. And Paul says many of those remain until now. Some have died, but many remain. And that's really a powerful statement by Paul. If you don't believe me, go ask people who saw him resurrected. 
Go ask people who saw the resurrected Jesus. Very strong statement on behalf of Paul in 1 Corinthians 15. In Acts chapter 1, verse 9, after he had said these things, he was lifted up while they were looking on, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And as they were gazing intently into the sky while he was going, two men in white clothing stood beside them, men of Galilee. Why do you stand looking into the sky? This Jesus who has been taken up from you into heaven will come in just the same way as you have watched him go into heaven. We look for Jesus to come, don't we? We look for him to come in the clouds of the sky. We don't expect him to set foot on this earth again, but we look for him to come back in the clouds of the sky in the same way as Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 4, that he will return with the angel, with the trumpet of God, right, and the dead in Christ will rise first. What a powerful resurrection passage that we wait for the ascension we wait for Jesus to come back. But you know the story, i got to throw this in. Because on this character study, we've been talking a lot about myth and legends. And two of the guys that are part of the crucifixion story that I think we really overlook are Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea. Um, can't say a lot about Nicodemus. There's a lot of legend around Joseph. Um, Nicodemus, though, who Jesus in John chapter 3 Nicodemus, who came to Jesus by night and said, what do I need to do, right? Jesus says, be born again, right? Jesus said, you must be born again to enter the kingdom of God. The ruler of Jews came to Jesus. Nicodemus, who before the Sanhedrin said, you have to try a man before you can convict him, right? Nicodemus, who brought that up. It was Nicodemus at the crucifixion of the death. And you have to look at the amount that he brought because if you look at this passage, it says, bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, but listen to what he says, about a hundred pounds weight. That's a tremendous, that's a tremendous value. We, we overlook that a lot of times. That's a king's burial. That's not a common man's burial. That's, that's a lot. hundred pounds. This stuff is expensive. This is, this is very expensive. And this is something that you wouldn't do normally for anybody. A hundred pounds. And I think that speaks volumes for Nicodemus for his love he had for Christ, for what he thought about Jesus, to bring that much value in his death, because that's a king's weight of spices. Very interesting to me, something we don't look at much. Nicodemus, who, uh, who had questioned Jesus, who had essentially stood up for Jesus, and who now would probably be converted to Jesus, who was with him in his death. We often criticize the Jews, don't we? Jesus so often criticized the Pharisees and the Sadducees, those of the Jews, Nicodemus, a Pharisee, but yet Nicodemus who turned towards Jesus. You know, Jesus said, I came to seek and save those who were lost, and Jesus knew that the Pharisees were lost. And yet Jesus didn't save them all, but Jesus saved some, didn't he? And Nicodemus was one of those. And I just think sometimes we miss Nicodemus. It was hasty, wasn't it? Before the Passover, before evening, Jesus died the third hour or sixth hour, ninth hour, late in the day, ninth hour. They had to get him off the cross. They had to get him to the tomb. They had to wrap him hastily, put him in, roll the stone over the entrance to the tomb. This had to be done in haste because it was quickly approaching the hour. Nicodemus prepared Nicodemus to come, but yet whose tomb did they lay him in? A very fulfillment of Isaiah 53 where it says he'll be laid with the rich in his death was part of the prophecy of Isaiah 53. And Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus were exemplified the rich. But to be laid with the rich in his death in the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea, a tomb hewn from Locke where no man had been laid, the scripture said. That was an expensive tomb. Tombs in that region were used over and over and over. Very expensive to have a tomb, especially one nobody had ever laid in. That was a really expensive piece of real estate. And yet Joseph of Arimathea begs for the body of Jesus. He stepped out and said to them, Are you angry? Because I begged the body of Jesus. Behold, I have put him in my new tomb. Now, this isn't Bible. Okay, I'm going to back up a little. I guess I should have thrown that out now. I'm getting into some late writings, like 4th century. But uh, this, is actually, um, this is actually some late writing, 4th century writing. But I just think it's really fascinating. So I'm throwing it out here to you tonight. Likewise, Joseph also stepped out and said to them, Why are you angry against me because I begged the body of Jesus? Behold, I have put him in my new tomb, wrapping in clean linen, and I have rolled a stone to the door of the tomb. 
And you have acted not well against the just man, because you have not repented of crucifying him, but also have pierced him with a spear. So, you know, we get some really light text on Joseph, not really Nicodemus, but we do get some light text on Joseph, and I think it's interesting, and especially I think the next thing I want to share with you is really interesting. Part of Christian tradition, uh, something that's been preserved, was it literal, did it happen? I don't know, but it's, I think it's interesting to put up. It says, On the day of the preparation, about the tenth hour, you shut me in, and I remained there for a whole Sabbath in full. And when midnight came, because Joseph speaking about himself, that they locked him away. In other words, the Jews locked him away. As I was standing and praying, the house where you shut me in was hung up by the four corners, and there was a flashing of light in mine eyes, and I fell to the ground trembling. Then someone lifted me up from the place where I had fallen and poured over me an abundance of water from the head even to the feet and put round my nostrils the odor of a wonderful ointment and rubbed my face with the water itself as if washing me and kissed me and said to me, Joseph, fear not, but open thine eyes and see who it is that speaks to thee. And looking, I saw Jesus and being terrified, I thought it was a phantom. And with prayer... And the commandments I spoke to him, and he spoke to me, and I said to him, Art thou Rabbi Elias? And he said to me, I'm not Elias. And I said, Who art thou, my Lord? And he said to me, I am Jesus, whose body thou didst beg from Pilate, and wrap in clean linen, and thou didst lay a napkin on my face, and didst lay me in, the, in thy new tomb, and roll a stone to the door of the tomb. Then I said to him that was speaking to me, Show me, Lord, where I laid thee. And he led me and showed me the place where I laid him, and the linen which I had put on him, and the napkin which I had wrapped upon his face. And I knew that it was Jesus. And he took hold of me with his hand and put me in the midst of my house through the gates were shut, and put me in my bed and said to me, Peace to thee. And he kissed me and said to me, For forty days go not out of thy house, for lo, I go to my brethren in Galilee. You know, late text. But I think that's really interesting. Sometimes I really enjoy reading. Some of the directs I really enjoy reading a lot of that stuff, so... I kind of share some of it with you, but it's not Bible, but I just think it's fascinating. And, you know, uh, the legends that surround things, this is a huge event. There's a lot of legend, a lot of text, a lot of writing, even 3rd and 4th century that really surround this event of Jesus, the death, the crucifixion, the resurrection of Jesus. And although we don't take that to be authentic, our spirit breathed, we don't take it necessarily to be authoritative, it's still kind of interesting, the myths and the legends that surround some of these events that we don't look at oftentimes in church or in a congregational setting, which I understand why we don't, but I still think it's fascinating. Behind every legend, behind every myth, there's a piece of truth. Am I right? You know, Babe the Blue Ox, uh, there really was a blue ox. Now, he wasn't the Babe the Blue Ox we sing about, but there really was. Or Paul Bunyan really was a man, right? There is a piece of truth behind every legend, piece of truth behind every myth. And so even when we look sometimes at light writings, we still understand there's pieces of truth behind the text. So it's interesting for me. I'm glad I get to share it with you. I think it's not something we look at that much. I appreciate getting the opportunity to get to share some of the things with you that I read and some of the things that I study in addition to the Bible because I do think some of the 3rd, 4th century texts are quite interesting within themselves. Um, Anyway, I hope you've enjoyed uh, Jesus. We'll move on to somebody else. If there's any way we can assist you, or would you let it be known as we stand and sing?